Hello world, my name is Monas and today we will talk about NoSQL. NoSQL is a common theme in the system design interviews and you're usually tested with the question, which database would you use for this application? And this video will help you answer that very question. So we will start by talking about relational databases and understand what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses. And then we will move on to the topics of NoSQL where we will understand different databases like MongoDB, Redis, New4j and understand when to use which type of database. And we will do all of this with some really cool code examples, which you can download from the link in the description. So without further ado, let's get started. A lot of us are already familiar with relational databases and the fact that data is structured in the form of tables. We use the word relational because relational databases allow us to define relationships between the tables. If we think about the database of a food delivery app, there are a bunch of things in the database. So let's try to take a basic use case from there. When you order food, you want it to be delivered sometimes at home, sometimes at the office, and sometimes at your friend's place where you hang out a lot. That makes three possible addresses linked to your account. In addition to this, there may be some more data in your account. For example, your user ID, your name, phone number, email, and such. Thinking about how we store the user's data, we can imagine a table with user details like this. Now, with this data, if we would like to add the address details, we can do it in two ways. One way is to create a secondary table called user address, which looks like this. In this table, each row represents an address and each address has a user ID attached to it, which refers to the user. So if a user has three addresses, there will be three rows with the same user ID. This kind of an arrangement is called normalized form. It looks quite optimal, but then if we want to fetch a full view of the user including all addresses, we would have to do a join. This would slow down the query a little bit. Similarly, the more tables and joins we have, the query becomes more and more complex and also slower. So in order to make it faster, we can take an alternate approach. We can extend the user details table and add the addresses there. The consolidated table would look somewhat like this. Now, the positive side to this approach is that since all the data is in the same table, the data can be retrieved much faster because we don't have to join anything. The downside to this is data duplication. Here, the data of the user, such as name, phone number, and such, is being duplicated, and the data will be duplicated even further with more addresses. So, we improve the query speed, but at the expense of data duplication. This kind of arrangement is called denormalized form. Now let's discover how we can try to solve this duplication problem with NoSQL. The term NoSQL evolved from a lot of different ideas, but today it's mostly interpreted as not only SQL. NoSQL is not a single technology, but rather a concept of representation of data in non-tabular format. It is also a common misconception that NoSQL means non-relational databases. This, however, is not true. There are some NoSQL databases which are highly relational and we will discover them later in this video. So let's start by exploring the NoSQL databases one by one. Continuing with the example of having addresses in the user profile, let's zoom out a little bit from a relational perspective and let's try to see the same data in another light. If you represent the same data in JSON format, it should look somewhat like this. This is a JSON document which is represented by an ID has the user details and the addresses arranged in JSON format. If we were to store this data exactly like this, then we would not need any joins because all of the data of the user is stored together. And the best part is we did not have to duplicate any data. These kind of non-relational databases which store the data in the form of documents are called document-based databases or simply document stores. If we think from the perspective of a relational database, a table is represented as a collection and each row is represented as a document. So just like a table contains a bunch of rows, a collection contains a bunch of documents. These databases store data in the form of JSON or binary JSON and some even use XML. Some popular examples of these document-based databases are MongoDB, Firebase, CouchDB and so on. It is also important to note that for relational databases, you need to define columns and their data types. But in a document store, you don't have to define which fields a collection will contain. And it's quite flexible that way. This feature can be a blessing or a curse depending on your use case. Now, at this point, it is reasonable to think that these document-based databases solve the limitations of the SQL-based databases. 
So we would be inclined to think that document-based databases are an answer to everything. Well, not quite. The rule of thumb with document-based databases is that data that is accessed together should be stored together. This is precisely how we prevent joins and increase the query speed. The key element here was that we also prevented duplication of data. With user addresses, it worked out perfectly because the user address is unique to every user. Now let's think about an e-commerce app which sells electronics. A new gaming console is being launched and people are just crazy about it. It is expected that millions of people will buy it. To buy it, they have to add it to the cart. Now, when people start adding their items to the cart, it is stored in the database. That's how you are able to close and reopen the app to find the same items in your cart. Now, this console, like other electronics on the website, has a bunch of properties like name, picture, description, price, and such. These properties are going to be the same for millions of users viewing and adding this console to the cart. If you use a document-based database for storing this data, the user's cart would look like this. Now, for millions of users who add this gaming console to the cart, the item details have to be copied for each user's cart. In this case, we are actually duplicating the data for millions of users. Now, in retrospect, if we think about SQL databases, we can actually prevent these millions of duplicates by using a relational database by just linking the console to each user's cart. Sure, we would have to do some joins, but it's better than having so many duplicates. Storing addresses along with the user details in a document store is okay because the address will not be duplicated across millions of users. In fact, only a few people might have the duplicate address. So it's easier to store the data together so that it is fetched together. However, in the gaming console example, if you're having millions of duplicates of the same data, we are actually better off with the relational database. So as you can see, choosing a database is not really about using some fancy capabilities, but it is all about understanding the use case and weighing out the pros and cons of each approach for that particular use case. Another common drawback of most document-based databases is that they have limited support for transactions. In very simple terms, a transaction ensures that if you are updating a bunch of things, either all of them are completely done or everything is rolled back. For example, if you are transferring $200 from one bank account to another, the debit from the first account and the credit to the second account should be done as one operation. If the debit from the first account fails due to any reason, the second account should not be credited. Similarly, if the debit from the first account succeeds, but the credit to the second account is not possible because it's blocked or invalid, then the $200 should be reverted back to the first account. So it's all or nothing situation. Document-based databases might not be able to support these kind of transactions especially when they get even more complex. This is why whenever you're thinking transactions, relational databases are a better choice because they're designed to handle transactions. There are some document stores which do allow transactions, but they often come with some restrictions. Now the question, when to use document-based databases? When you have a read-heavy application which does not require transactions, and you can store the data in denormalized form without duplication, Document-based databases could be a decent solution. So we talked about relational and document-based databases and how they have their own pros and cons. Now let's take another example. When you open your food delivery app, you usually see your default address selected. During peak times like lunch hour or dinner time, a lot of people use the app. To fetch the default address of any user, a query to the database needs to be made. To save this round trip from a relational database or a document store, a key value store can help speed things up. Key value stores provide a fast access of data based on a key. In our case, the key could be the user ID for which we can store an address. The query to fetch this would look like this, where edgeget is the command to fetch the data followed by the user ID and the data that we need to retrieve, which in this case is the address. So when you open your app, the app sends a request to the server which fetches your default address from the key value store using this query. The speed of retrieval is much faster than relational or even document-based databases because the cached key value pair is stored in the memory, which is significantly faster than the hard drives. It is also to be noted that key value stores are not usually used as primary databases, but rather as a cache. 
which means that the actual data is stored on a primary database, which may be relational or non-relational, and a key value store would store a smaller portion of this data. Now, the question is when to use key value pair databases. These databases can really shine when you require super fast access of a limited amount of data. For example, the default address of a user. All right, so we covered a lot of databases and we left the most fancy one for the end. That is graph-based databases. Let's take another use case of food delivery apps. You're in the mood for some Italian food and you have your favorite Italian restaurant where you order the food. Unfortunately, when you search for this restaurant, it is closed. Now the app gives you recommendations of some other Italian restaurants and their goal is that they don't lose the business. So they have to give you some really good recommendations which match your preferences. Now let's think a little bit about how this might work behind the scenes. To give you these really good recommendations, there would be a bunch of data points involved. For example, the cuisine should be Italian. They should have similar ratings as your regular restaurant. They should have at least some items in the menu which are usually ordered by you. And most importantly, they should be within the delivery range of your address. This seems like a lot of relational data, and it is possible that a standard relational database is used behind the scenes. So if we try to imagine the table structure, it could look somewhat like this. Here we have a restaurant which has an ID, name and address, among other things. Each restaurant serves multiple dishes, has a location and a cuisine. Now imagine the query which has to consolidate all these data points to build up recommendations, and that too in real time. This query would look somewhat like this. Now this query will suck out your soul, your will to live and the performance of the application. There may be thousands of restaurants in a city and tens of thousands across a country. Building recommendations this way with so many joins in real time is not scalable. In order to traverse through these kind of complex relationships, graph-based databases were introduced. Graph databases are NoSQL databases, but they are highly relational and they also support transactions. So if we represent the same data in a graph database, it would look like this. Now here, the data is represented in the form of nodes, and these nodes are connected to each other. There are nodes for restaurants, the dishes they serve, their cuisine, and where they are located. For example, in this scenario, we can clearly see the two locations in red. In this location, there are four restaurants. We see two Italian restaurants, one Greek restaurant, and an Indian restaurant, along with the dishes they serve. And all of this data is connected to each other through a pointing mechanism. If we use the same recommendation logic in a graph database like Neo4j, we can rewrite the same logic in cipher query language like this. No crazy joins just telling Neo4j to find the restaurant Osteria Sippi, extract its properties and use these properties to find other restaurants in the same location. In the end, we simply specify what all properties of each recommended restaurant we want to see. For example, their cuisine, the dishes they serve and where they are located. This is kind of like a select query for SQL database. Now, if we run this query, we can see the perfect recommendation as we expected before. If you would like to play around with this setup, you can download all of this code from my public repository. Link is down in the description. You can also try to add your own data, visualize it and see how the recommendations change. All the details are present in the repository. So that's all folks, I hope you have a much better understanding of NoSQL databases and you will be able to make better architectural choices in system design interviews and more importantly in real life. Write down in the comments below if you have any questions. See you in the next video. Bis dann.